Amen. Welcome to Abundant Life Tabernacle. Amen. It's going to be a great day in God's house. Uh, if you would, stand with me. Uh, those that are here with us today at LT that are helping out and also across your homes, if you would, stand. Amen. Wherever you are at, that is your church today. That is the place that you are going to meet. With Jesus Christ. Amen. I, it is my honor to get to announce today that next Sunday, May 31st, we're going to be back in God's house. Amen. Amen. Back in God's house at Abundant Life Tabernacle, we are going to have a great, fantastic time. I wonder if you would right now just lift your hands and let's thank the Lord. He has kept us. Hallelujah, church. He has protected us. Hallelujah, Lord. He has had mercy upon his people. Lord, I thank you right now for your love. And I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, oh God, that you have given us direction. That you have shown compassion upon your people, oh Lord. I thank you for the unity that we have felt amongst the church members, amongst the church family, oh God. I thank you for those, oh Lord, that have called the church seeking a place to go to church after this uh, quarantine has been lifted. Lord, I give you glory and I give you honor. Lord, I thank you that we're going to be able to be back in your house next Sunday. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And it is Pentecost Sunday, amen? That is our holiday. That is our day to celebrate. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in the week, Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Man, I just, all this week I begin to think, this verse, I was glad when we came up with the date, May 31st. I was glad that they gathered in the upper room and Pentecost was poured out. And I am so thankful that next Sunday we get to smash them together and what a presence of God is going to be in this place. Amen. We'll be sending out some more information this week. Uh, but just a couple quick things for you to remember and think about is that the doors will not be open until 1015. And at 1015, we will have ushers seat you to make sure that we can get the most out of our socially distanced chairs as we can uh, and also during that time, we'll be uh, practicing some good social distancing. We won't be doing the usual handshaking, patting on the back. Uh, I know these are some unique and different times that we live in, but we want to provide a safe place that we can gather together and worship the King of Kings. Amen. Uh, it is also my honor to get to announce we have two prime parking spots that we have out and right in front of the doors of our church uh, that are going to be given away today. Uh, our Mother of the Year parking spot. Uh, Brother Shira, give me a drum roll there, please. Let the anticipation rise. Mother of the Year parking spot goes to Sister Pam Boris. Amen. Sister Boris, we love you. We appreciate you. Uh, we thank you for bringing your children and the children that you babysit to Sunday school. Uh, she brings them, uh, whether they're fighting with her or they're not fighting with her, but she brings them to God's house. She brings them in. And uh, also with the schooling, being uh, at home right now, she's had to homeschool a lot of kids. So thank you for your time. Thank you for loving your children and the children that you're babysitting and bringing them to God's house. But that parking spot is yours for the rest of the year. Mother of the year parking spot. Amen. I don't know how moms do it, but they do. They are true superheroes. And Brother Steeroff, if you would, one more time. I've got a dentist around the corner parking spot. And that goes to Sister Winnie Steeroff. Off. Uh, she has been filling in uh, just some uh, different roles and ministries around Abundant Life Tabernacle. Thank you for all the work that you do. We appreciate you. You have a prime spot 
Brother Siroff, it looks like you've got a prime spot to park in as well. Uh, he is happy about that, but thank you to Sister Ravores for supporting the church. Thank you to Sister Siroff for supporting the church. Amen, and we love you and appreciate you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's often that with holidays and festivities that we forget the real meaning of why we have certain holidays. And I want to take a moment and address Memorial Day. I appreciate the men and women that have served our country and that are still with us, but that that's a Veterans Day. We, we get to tell them thank you on that day, and I know that will never be enough. But Memorial Day is for those that have passed away in the line of two. It's for those that have protected this country and love this country. And it's not about the barbecues or the extended weekends. It's about those that paid the ultimate price. That we could stand here in God's house and say, I love you, Jesus. So with that, I want to say to all the families out there that have had somebody pass away in the line of duty, thank you for those individuals. Thank you for the sacrifices that they made that I can lift my hands in God's house. This is still a country that is free. This is still a country where I can read my Bible, I can pray out loud. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for the sacrifices that you have made. And I can think of no better way to honor those men and women that have given their life for this country than to give God glory with every bit of energy that I have today, with all that my lungs can put out in a song, I can think of no better way than to give God glory because of our freedom. Amen? Amen. Let's worship. Let's praise God and give Him the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Amen. Paul is one of my favorite authors. He is one of my favorite Biblical individuals. In fact, he is uh, he is one of my uh, Bible heroes, if you'd like to put it that way. But he says something very profound here. He says that we have this ministry. We're going to go to prayer here in just a moment, 
And I want you to focus your prayer on that, that phrase right there. We have this ministry. You have a ministry. You have a ministry in the kingdom of God. You may not realize it. You may not be living it. You may not be fulfilling it. But you have a ministry in the kingdom of God. If you would, I know we have some uh, family and friends that are camping this weekend. If you would, stand in your campsites. Stand in your homes. If you would, lift your hands here in the tabernacle as well. And let's thank God that we have a ministry. Amen. Let's thank God that we get to be His people. That we get to be His children. Hallelujah, Lord. It's an honor to be your child. It's an honor to be able to serve you. It's an honor to be able to carry out your word, oh God. I thank you for the responsibility that you have placed upon each and every one of us. Lord, we have a ministry, and we don't want to faint. We don't want to a lack in doing it, oh God. We don't want to put it off. But God, I pray that right now we would realize the day and time that we live in, the urgency of the hour, the importance of our ministries. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Clap your hands into the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, you may be seated. Amen, we have a ministry. We have received mercy, and we must faint not. Amen. I want to read to you another translation of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And here's how it says. It says, since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run in, into occasional hard times. I don't know about you. I don't know what the definition of hard times is. But I would say that we're living in one of those right now. Yes. I, I don't know what your definition moving forward of hard times is. But I would say this was going to be pretty near the top. Amen. But verse 2, here's what it says. We refuse to wear masks and play games. I laughed when I read this. I, I thought it very humorous that the Lord had given me this portion of scripture. And uh, the translation says, we refuse to wear masks and play games. But it goes on to say this. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. So with that scripture being read, I want to teach on this. I want to preach on this. I want to offer some advice on this. Take off the spiritual mask. Amen? Amen. Verse 2 states, refusing to wear a mask and playing games. Let me just get this out in front before you fill up the church email the church comment Facebook section. I am not preaching against wearing a face mask, okay? Uh, thanks to my uh, sister-in-law, Sister Gardner, I now have a mask. But it is hard to preach in it. Uh, Brother Barnhart would have to turn my mic up exceptionally loud. Uh, I am not preaching against masks, okay? Let's just get that out on front street. So before you send all the upset uh, messages or text messages, uh, I'm not preaching against that. What I'm preaching about today is a spiritual face mask that has been worn for a very, very long time in this country. 
Those that proclaim the word of God, but don't live the word of God. Amen? Amen. What I'm referencing today is that in our society, it's very common to say, I'm a Christian. It's very common to say, I want to do God's will. I want to live like the Bible wants me to live. It's common to hear that from anybody you run into. But I'll tell you what's also common is to hear that and see the exact opposite. Amen? That's what I'm calling today's spiritual face mask. Saying one thing, but doing another. That scripture, that portion that I read, said that we've got to stop playing games. If I could say something today that would maybe stay with you uh, past whatever else I preach, stop playing games with your salvation. Stop playing games with your children's salvation. You see, we are living in a day and a time when we had better get it right. Yes. We had better preach truth. We had better live truth. We had better be about truth. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about any certain denomination. I'm talking about all denominations. Every denomination has people that say one thing and do the opposite. So I'm not talking about apostolic. I'm not talking about the Baptist. I'm not talking about Catholics. I'm not talking about any certain denomination. I'm talking about people, men and women of God, that claim to be Christians but are living it. Amen? My thoughts and my mind have just kind of been... Just, just the heaviness uh, the last several weeks. And, and it wasn't a, a fear or a lack of faith. Um, what it was is seeing the roller coaster and being on the roller coaster that we're living in right now. Anybody else feel that way? Mm -hmm. You watch the news one day. Things are looking bright. Things are looking great. And the next day, things are looking bad. It's an emotional roller coaster. One day, the stores are closing, and then they're opening. There's all these things going on. I will tell you this, and here is where I want to get to. I want to speak to the individuals today, and I pray that we all listen, because we can all change. We can all get closer to God. Yes. We can all Hear that still small voice if we choose to. Yes. First Peter chapter 1 verse 8 says, Who having not seen, I have not seen the Lord yet. I don't know if anybody in here that has seen the Lord yet. But it says, ye love. I haven't seen him, but I love him. Yes. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believe him. I haven't seen him, but I love him. I haven't seen him, but I believe in him. Yes. But I know that he placed something inside of me. When he filled me with the gift of the Holy Ghost, there was a power. There was an anointing that came upon me. And many of you that have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But there was a joy. And in 1 Peter says, a joy unspeakable yes. and full of your glory. Yes. I need to be filled with God's glory. I need to be filled with the joy of the Lord. And what is bothering me the last couple of weeks is not seeing the consistency and the joy and the power and the glory of God in the people of God. I'm, I'm sure it got quiet out there. It got quiet in here as well. We need to be about our Father's business. Yes. We've got to be about the anointing of Jesus Christ. It was nice to hear President Trump say that churches were essential this week, yes. wasn't it? Yes. And then it, it was awesome to hear that. I, I went back, I found the clip of it, and I listened to it several times. It was just nice to hear a president say 
Churches are essential. Amen. President Trump also argued that businesses like liquor stores, medical services like abortion clinics, shouldn't have been reopened before religious That's institutions right. were open. Amen. amen, amen, amen. We can stop right there and preach on that for a while if you want, but we won't. And then our president said something very profound. He said, in America, we need more prayers, not less. Do you know what we need more of? We need more people praying than posting. It's true. That's, that's the fact. That's the truth. We need more people sharing the love of God than sharing a post that says if you send to 10 people, you're going to be blessed. Come on, let's get real. Mm -hmm. We need people of God to be people of God. Yes. We need to have that joy unspeakable, but we need to have the glory of God radiating from us. Okay. We've got to be about our Father's business. Yes. It's been an emotional roller coaster, and I'll be honest with you, I'm sick of the emotional roller coaster. Anybody want to get off this roller coaster? Yes. I, as I've gotten older, I can still ride the rides, but I tell you, it doesn't feel the same. Uh, we could go to Kings Island, we could go to Cedar Point, and uh, I had skipped riding for quite a few years, and I decided again that I was going to ride some a couple years ago, and uh, we took my daughter and my nephew. And we took some of her friends, and then uh, this past year we took all of our kids, and we took uh, Michael, Malaya, and Haley with us, and Addie. And you know what? I rode rides, but I tell you what: secretly, when they weren't looking, I was like, "Oh, oh man, I don't feel good. I don't feel good." But I didn't dare let them see it. We've been on an emotional roller coaster that I think about everybody is sick of. I'm not saying to stop with the social distancing. But what makes me sick most of all is the spiritual roller coaster that I see sweeping through a lot of churches. You see, we were alarmed when we first heard about COVID-19. In fact, we were so alarmed that we went out and bought every single roll of toilet paper this country had. Who gets scared and goes and buys toilet paper? I don't know. That was the first for me. Hand sanitizer could not be found. Masks were in demand. Uh, we watched as the number of cases increase. We, we heard social distancing become a common phrase that I had never used prior to 2020. I had never used the word social distancing together. But now, how many times do we say it today? Right. We're social distancing. We've arranged the chairs in the sanctuary to social, social distance. distance. We, we practice this. The doors of restaurants, small businesses, and churches were closed. More and more face masks were appearing every day. People became scared. People became aggressive. You know what's good about this? People started to pray. I'm glad that people started to pray. People begin to post on social media accounts that they wish they were in church. People begin tuning in to YouTube and Facebook who haven't gone to church in a long, long time. Uh -huh. They begin tuning in on Sunday mornings to hear the presence of God, to see the presence of God, and to hear the Word of God preached. I'm talking about this has been an emotional roller coaster for everybody. Somewhere in the middle of this, it became a political battleground. I'm not sure where it started, where it's going to end, but this is bigger than a political battleground right now. We have people that were happy to receive a stimulus check. But we also have people that are mad they still haven't received their stimulus check. We have people mad about the quarantine, the stay-at-home orders. We can find toilet paper now. Hand sanitizer is missing along with butter. 
I'm thinking about putting them both on the side of a milk carton. Picture of butter and a picture of hand sanitizer. They're missing. What, what do you do with hand sanitizer and butter? I'm not quite sure. But they're both still missing. Everyone's wearing a mask. The pressure's on to wear a mask, to not wear a mask. Restaurants are starting to open. Bars have opened. Churches are starting to reopen. What I'm telling you is that we have been on an emotional roller coaster, but the people of God should have still been showing a joy unspeakable through all of this. There should have still been a glory of God that was radiating from each and every child of Jesus Christ. That's what has been bothering me. This country needs men and women of God that are rejoicing. We're not oblivious to what's going on. But that your neighbor can look at you and you can walk out and say, praise God, I've got another day to breathe. Praise God, I'm here another day. Praise God, thank you for food on my table. Praise God, I've still got a job. Praise God, my family's still safe. Praise God, this thing hasn't touched us. But a people of God, that's why I say this is bigger than apostolics. This is all denominations. We need to have a joy that is unspeakable and full of his glory. Amen? But what we're finding is that the people of God are wearing a mask and playing games with their salvation. If they're, you know, that song we sang there right before I started preaching, uh, let us be more aware of your presence, God. Uh -huh. Let us be more aware of it. You know what we need to be more aware of? The times that we are living in. We need to be aware of the things of God. We need to be aware of what is taking place. And again, I'm not talking about a physical mask. I'm talking about a spiritual mask. A mask, it's used to hide your true identity. Go ahead and name your superhero out there. Your, your Batman, your Robin. Who's he, superhero is Robin? I mean, come on. He's a wimpy sidekick. But you, you've got these heroes that are wearing a mask. Why are they wearing the mask? To hide their true identity. And so when I talk about a spiritual mass, it's the people of God that have been blessed. It's the people of God that have been shown God's glory and his favor, but are living out the glory of God. They're not sharing the glory of God. They're not projecting the joy that is unspeakable. They've got a spiritual mask on, if you will, and they're walking amongst us. They're walking out into this life, and they're not helping. They're not sharing. They're not projecting Jesus Christ. Paul's saying here in 2 Corinthians that we have a ministry. I don't care how old you are. My youngest daughter, Jane, is with us this morning. Jada, you have a ministry. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think of some of our elder saints, brother and sister Wilkinson, sister Williams, you have a ministry. Uh -huh. Every day that you have breath in your lungs, you have a ministry. It doesn't matter the age or the environment that you're living in. You can still project the joy unspeakable and the glory of Jesus Christ. We have a spiritual project. We have a ministry that is taking place, and it's all around us. I'm not talking about within the four walls of Abundant Life Tabernacle. I'm talking about your communities. I'm talking about your neighborhoods. I'm talking about your jobs. I'm talking about the daycares that your children go to. I'm talking about the schools that your kids are going to return to. Each of us has a ministry field that we need to be working in. Amen? He writes in 2 Corinthians that we have received mercy. Now is not the time to faint. Now is not the time to back down. 
Now's not the time to give in to the pressures of this world. But now is the time to shine. Now's the time. This is our time. I preached several weeks ago about now is the time. And that's still ringing in my ears. Paul, his time was 2 Corinthians. His time was when the, the conversion experience on the Damascus Road. That was his time. This is our time. Yes. This is your time yes. to shine for Jesus Christ. This is the period of time that God designated for you and I to be operating in, to be witnessing in, to be sharing God's love in. Now is the time. You said, really? This is what God wanted? Uh, what's the date today? Uh, 24. God wanted me, May 24th, 2020, to be sharing his love? Why did he let me live in the middle of a pandemic? Why? Because he designed you. He created in you. He placed within you a joy unspeakable. Yes. That you could share the joy of Jesus Christ. He trusts you. He loves you. You don't think he's going to protect you? He's going to get you through any situation you come up against. But now is the time. We have a ministry. And you have to understand something. Paul, after he was converted on the Damascus Road, could have put on a spiritual mask. He could have went into hiding. He could have said, you know what? I've done so much in my past life. I thank God for the mercy. I thank God for the salvation. I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. He could have. But as you know, Saul, and a common misconception is that Saul's name was changed by the Lord. It really wasn't on that road. His name was Saul, and his name was Paul. One was Greek, one was Hebrew. And I don't blame the guy for going by a different name after he was converted. True. Yeah. I don't blame him. Uh, he says, you know, Saul's just got too much going on. Lord, change me. I'm going to go by Paul. I completely can understand that. But Saul was an evil man. He was a hunter of Christians. Acts 7.58 says this. And cast him out of the city, speaking about Stephen, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Who was that young man? It tells us. His name was Saul. Saul was the one with all this zeal, all this determination that was leading the persecution against the Christians. Saul was trying to destroy the church. He was going from house to house. He was dragging men and women and children from their homes and putting them into prison. He was the orchestrator. He was the organizer. He was the enforcer. He was the one that was taking the persecution to the church. But I want to tell you this morning, praise God, in the middle of what he thought he was doing to destroy the church, God was using him to push the gospel into the uttermost parts of the earth. In the middle of the persecution, two big miracles take place. The church didn't diminish because of the persecution People were fleeing their homes. They were leaving the cities. They were branching out. And you know what? The word of God was branching out as well. The people of God were moving into areas that they wouldn't have gone to. I don't know why we're in the middle of a pandemic. But all I've got to say is that maybe God's trying to push us into some areas that we've never ministered. Maybe God's trying to push us into some ministries, into some ministry fields that we've never even dreamed of. God's word will not return void. It's going to come back and it's going to accomplish what God wants it to do. The second miracle was the conversion of from Saul. God changed him. And because he changed him, many others were led to Christ. So I, I begin to think about the similarities between a persecution and a pandemic. Both are really, really bad. I don't want to be in either one of them. No. 
but as a child of the king, as one that's been filled and mercy has been covered and poured out upon, one that has joy unspeakable and filled with the glory of God, I've got to look around and find out what's truly happening here. I believe the word of God is entering into some avenues that we have never ventured down. Amen? There are some roads that we've never driven. There are some houses that we've never knocked on. There are some individuals that might be watching or listening that have never had the word of God preached into. I believe that God was the one that orchestrated a lot of this. He's allowing it to take place. God is the one that's in control. Yes. We look at Paul, the writer of 13 New Testament books. The same man that killed Christians is the same man that authored 13 New Testament books. He started at least 14 church plants. Praise God. There are going to be some individuals that come out of this pandemic on fire for God. There's going to be some individuals that are aware of what's taking place. And they're going to come out and they're going to start planting some churches. They're going to put some preaching points in. And people are going to be saved. But as I begin to think about this, Paul could change his name. But he was still Paul. There were still individuals that recognized him. Maybe he had persecuted some. And he came into contact with them again. It would have been very easy for Paul to put on a spiritual face mask, absorb the glories of God, the mercies of God, to sit back and do nothing with his spiritual face mask on. But do you know what Paul had to go through? He had to face those families. Think about it. The one that orchestrated so much pain, imprisonment for families, torture, and persecution, he stands in front of them and preaches Jesus only. He doesn't put on a face mask. He says, I don't have time to play games. I've got a ministry. God did something for me, and I've got to move. I've got to take this word to somebody. I just wondered if there's anybody out there that can get a hold of this vision. Take off that spiritual face mask. Cast it to the side and say, this is my talk. This is my ministry. And I've got to do what God wants me to do. Amen? Yes. God saved Paul. He loved Paul. God saved you. And he loves you. But he didn't save you for you to sit on a pew and do nothing. I'll tell you what aggravates me. Professional Christians. And again, I'm not talking any certain denomination. I'm talking all denominations. God will do a mighty work in an individual's life. And there will be a change. And as God is getting closer to that individual and as he's blessing them and as he, uh, uh, he's enhancing and making their life better, some people become professional Christians. They sit on a pew and just soak up the mercies of God. Here's what professional Christians are doing. They attend church, but do not tend to the presence of the Lord. They attend, but they don't wait upon God. They don't come into these altars and entertain the presence of God. They don't walk amongst the pews, pray with people. They come in and they soak up with the power of God that's in that service. And they walk back out. They sing with their lips, but not with their heart. They give tithes and offerings to the church, but it's never sacrificially, and it's never of themselves. They put on a mask and they say the right things. But they witness to nobody. They love their possessions, but not the things of God. They love having friends, but not the people of God. You might be saying, Pastor, pump the brakes a little bit. We're not even in church right now. But I tell you, we
We have been in church the entire time. Yes. God's church has never stopped when we close the doors at AOT. Church has never stopped. It's never ceased. The ministry of Jesus Christ has continued on. Your ministries have continued on. Amen. Or at least, I hope so. That's what's been tearing at me so much. Professional Christians love that the doors have been closed and all they have to do is walk downstairs, turn on their TV, watch a service, and go right back to bed and right back to their livestock. There's been no responsibility. There's been no one to check up on them. There's been no one to encourage them. Professional Christians are wearing a mask and they're not doing anything for the kingdom of God. You say this is a little tough today. It is. But we've got to be the church that continues through a pandemic. We've got to be the people of God that when hate is being spewed all around, it's the joy that we're still speaking about. It's the love that we're still showing. The Apostle Paul says, we had better faint not. We had better not fail. Uh -huh. God has given us a responsibility. He has placed something upon our shoulders that we have to do, that we need to do. And I ask you this morning, do you feel the responsibility of the Holy Ghost upon your life? If you do right now, conviction is setting in. But if you don't feel anything, maybe you need to ask, am I a professional Christian? Maybe you need to start questioning, why do I really go to church? Am I going so that others can see me or so that God sees me? Maybe we need to stop asking why we're living in the middle of a pandemic and start asking the right question. God, what do you want me to do? In this pandemic. Yes. What souls do you want me to reach? What doors do you want me to go through? Uh -huh. Why should we do this? Paul answers this question. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3. But if our gospel. Say our gospel. Our gospel. Be hit. Go ahead and say it with me. Be hit. Look at this next part. I pray you have your Bibles out. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Oh, man. If I hide, Lord of God, if I hide it and I don't let anybody see it, the lost are not going to find him. We've got to take the word of God out. We've got to take the word of God out. We've got to let people see it. We've got to let people experience it. Yes. You know, it's not the gospel according to Benjamin Tappan. It's not the gospel according to Bishop Roscoe's way. It's the gospel according to Jesus Christ. Yes. But if I hide it, some are not going to find it. Paul was mindful of his past, but he was understanding of the importance of the gospel. Uh -huh. He refused to let the challenges around him and of his past restrain him from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't neglect it. He didn't put it on the back burner. He didn't say maybe I'll get it tomorrow. Maybe I'll get it next year. He didn't say maybe 2020 has been a rough year. I'm really not going to do anything for God this year. He says I've got to be about it. I've got to be about the gospel. Because if we hide it, some are never going to find it. Uh -huh. Come on Christians. Come on people of the Bundle Life Tabernacle. We've got to stop hiding this gospel. 
We've got to stop playing games and take off our spiritual mats. Romans 1 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It's for everyone. But when I hide it, do you know what I'm doing? I'm being selective with it. God says it's for all. But how many times have we said that individual doesn't care about church? That individual doesn't want to hear about Jesus Christ. That individual doesn't want prayer. That individual could care less about this. You know what? It might be true. But that is no excuse for us to stop praying and fasting for that soul. Uh That is no excuse for us to stop offering a Bible study. That is no excuse for us to not send a text and say, hey, I woke up this morning, you were on my mind, I'm praying that you have a great day. You know what that does? That tells that individual that no matter how many times they reject you, Uh the gospel is still available to them. Because it's not a rejection of you and I, it's a rejection of Jesus Christ. Uh But Jesus says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth. We, the church, Christians, need to make sure that we are available with the word of God. Amen? Amen. But spiritual mass hide who you are. They hide the people of God. So I ask you this question. Do others see you as a person of God? Do they see you as a man and woman of God? Do they see you joyful and uplifting? Are you filled with faith? Or are you filled with fear? Are you the one they ask to pray for a friend or a family member or a situation involving them? Are you giving good godly advice? Or are you giving advice that relates to this world? Are you speaking with love towards others? And do others feel the peace of God coming from you? Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hit. You know what? You can try, you can try, you can try. And there are going to be those that reject you and reject Jesus Christ. But you know what? There's still more. You could go to a grocery store. You could go to the mall. You could walk down the street. And I believe if you did that every single day, you would still find people you have never ran into before. Uh Let's read it again. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill. A man and woman of God that is letting the joy and the glory of God project from them cannot be hid. It can't be extinguished unless you let it be extinguished. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do you know what it's time for? And I I know this term is used loosely, the word Christian. It's time for Christians to stand out for the right reasons. It's time for us to let our light shine for the right reasons. Amen? Amen. It's time for us to come out of the shadows, remove the mask, and live the word of God out loud. Do you know one of the biggest things that people don't like about Christians? Hypocrites. Saying one thing and doing the opposite. Do you know what would erase that? Living for Jesus Christ. It would take away the number one reason, and it's no excuse not to serve God. I know that. Mm-hmm. And we can go down that path another day. We're not going to 
I'm not going to chase rabbits this morning. It's no excuse. But we could still let our light shine. Turn with me to Exodus 27 20. Exodus 27 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, I'm sorry, pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. There's nothing wrong with the anointing from Jesus Christ. But I will tell you, what happens to the anointing from the Lord is we dilute it. We let things of this life enter in with that oil, and it dilutes it, and it doesn't burn properly. Why are so many people on an emotional roller coaster? Why are they on a spiritual high, and then they're down slow, spiritual high, then they're down slow? Their oil has been diluted. It says a pure oil, all of beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. That is in a good year and in a bad year. When finances are plenty and finances are lacking. Mm -hmm. In good health and bad health. Your light is burning. Your lamp is bright. So what's bothered me so much is the ups and the downs. What happened with our oil burning so brightly 24-7? When did we decide or when did we get instructions from God that it's okay to turn the light off right now? You're going through a rough patch. I can't read it. I can't find it. But we find so many Christians saying, I've got a right to be upset. I've got a right to do what I do. I've got a right to make a decision contrary to the word of God. And then next week, click, turn the lamp back on, and now I'm serving God. Come on. Let's live for God 24-7. Yes. Let's live for God seven days a week. Yes. Let's let those around us know that we're about our Father's business. Amen? Amen? That light should never, ever go out. You know, this week I uh, I watched something. It was a... Uh, Excellent speaker. He's a well-known speaker. Seems like a very nice individual. I have nothing bad to say about him. Um, many considered him to be a good Christian. But as he spoke, there was no anointing. There was no conviction that came from the Word of God. It was more of a self-help seminar than the Lord doing something. And it made me think about this. When your car is in need of repairs... You go to a profession. Mm -hmm. You take it to a mechanic. Yep. You try to do it yourself, some of you, me included. I tell you what, I'm going to be calling a mechanic by the end of it. I'm going to have a, a, a cup of extra bolts. And I'm not going to know where they came from. Your wiring goes bad in your house. Who do you call? An electrician. Uh -huh. You want to purchase a house. You go to a financial institution yep. for a loan. So tell me this. When I need my heart mended, why do I go to a self-help? I can't do it. Only he can heal a broken heart. When I need forgiveness of sins, why would I go to some self-help self guru and not to Jesus Christ. Why would I turn to myself when I'm the reason I'm in the trouble? Mm -hmm. Satan gets too much credit. He gets too much glory for the bad things that happens in our life when we are the author a lot of times of our own distress. When I need a savior, I've got to go to the rock that is higher than yes. I. I've got to go to the one that his thoughts are above my thoughts. Yes. And his ways are better than my ways. I need to go to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So let's remove the spiritual mask. Let's remove the Christian facade. 
And let's live for God, shall we? Amen. We've got to get real. We need Jesus. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, too many Christians are being led around by their feelings. Have you ever heard uh, somebody say, I just don't feel like going? I don't feel like going here. I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel this and I don't feel that. Now, I'm not trying to minimize our feelings. Our feelings are important. And we need to listen to them and become familiar with them and know. But that doesn't mean that our feelings are always honest with us. Let's look at something here. Anxiety. I, I am not minimalizing uh, anxiety at all. It is a sincere and good feeling when you hear footsteps behind you in a dark parking garage that you feel a little anxious, like, okay, I need to get out of here. Maybe you're along the edge of a cliff and you're like, okay, I'm too close to the edge. I need to get, you know, anxious, anxiety, that, uh, that's something real. But when anxiety controls you and you're walking down the street and all you can worry about is what each and every individual is thinking about you, anxiety is a bad thing. It's controlling you. Feelings lie to us. Let me give you an example of this as well. We live in a social media world. Do you rare? Uh, it's once in a while, so I won't say never. Rarely do people post the low points of their life on social media. Do you know that there's actually people that have committed suicide because they're on social media so much and they feel that everybody else has such a good life except for them. It happens. Your feelings will tell you your life stinks. They're all living the dream. Their cars don't break down. Oh, look. How many pictures of barbecue can you put on Facebook? Really? How many pictures of certain things can you put on Facebook? Social media. We look at these and our feelings tell us they have it better than we do. Oh man, they're not going through the things that I go through. Oh, they don't have that husband that I've got. Man, they don't have the wife that I have. Man, their kids are always perfect angels. Mine aren't. Our feelings lie to us. You see someone talking and they, they casually look in your way and as they're talking they laugh and you instantly feel they're talking about you. Our feelings lie to us. They could have nothing. They, they, they're probably not even talking about you. But all of a sudden we went from feeling that they're talking about us to our feelings get hurt, or we get mad, a grudge is formed, anger sets in, and the enemy has received a victory. All over our feelings. We get led by our feelings when in all reality, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. We're supposed to be led by the Word of God. Amen? It's Proverbs 17, 17. I want to bring this verse out. A friend loveth at all times. You know, it was common in elementary school to hear, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. But I have to be honest with you. I think I hear it more out of adults anymore than I do out of school kids. I've heard it from my girls coming home from school. Well, me and Rachel aren't friends anymore. Oh, why aren't you friends anymore? She wouldn't talk to me at recess. It's true. But then past reading, you hear the same thing. We let our feelings dictate some things. But Proverbs 17, 17 says this. A friend loveth at all times. Uh-oh. If we're not talking to somebody, what was leading us at that time? Our feelings. Our anger. 
But if we were being led by the word of God, it says a friend love at all times. So let's remove the spiritual mask. Let's be the Christians that we're supposed to be, that we're called to be. Let's navigate through these delicate times as men and women of God, shall yes. we? Yes. Yeah. Back in the Bible times, there was no electric lights. There was no flashlights. Uh, people used lanterns, and they were usually made of clay with a candle or a piece of cloth dipped in oil. And these, they're called lamps, lights, uh, were mentioned in the Bible. And I know it's hard for us sometimes to think back and realize how things were. But few roads were paved. I mean, it might have looked like Wilson Road after a while. It was, you know, Wilson Road's a rough road. Often, coming close to cliffs and ledges, the ground was hard and rocky, making travel at night very, very difficult. So people would have a lamp with them. Sometimes it would be tied to the end of a rope that they could hold, and it would light the path as they walked. But there were other times there was a small lamp that people would have, and they would attach it to their ankles. That when they took a step, it would light their path, and they could see the rocks, they could see the holes, they could see the pitfalls that they were about to step in, and they could stop and be safe. They could stop their families and be safe. But I want to tell you that God's Word is a lamp unto my feet. It's going to stop me from falling into some of the holes that Satan has laid for me. Come on, church. It's time for the people of God to be led by the word and not by their feelings. Psalms 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We've got to stop hiding the word. Get it out of your backpack and let it light your path. Get it off the shelf at home. Read it and let it light your path. Carry it with you in your cars. Read it and let it light your path at work. But I'm telling you, we need to be led by the Spirit of God. People need to see the joy and the glory of God radiating from us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. Oh, but praise God, now ye are light in the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. So here's the simple instructions. You ready for it, Brother Sirach? Walk as children of light. That's, that's good stuff right there. That's like mic drop, walk off the stage, leave it alone. Walk as children of the light. That means putting aside our spiritual mask and being the men and women that God has called us to be. That means putting aside the double life, one thing in church and another thing at home. On one hand, the world, and the other hand is Jesus Christ. That means putting aside our hate and our anger and our prejudices toward others. That means picking up love and compassion and mercy toward souls. That means being children of the light. Yeah. And I came across an article this week, and I uh, shortened it down, and you can read it yourselves and look it up. It's 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 uh, it's not a long article, but it says according to the San Francisco Chronicles date book, a man by the name of Will Carroll, and that's a thrash band. He's a drummer for them. Was infected with COVID and was medically induced into a coma for 12 days. During this coma, he had visions of his body plummeting into hell where he was punished for his sins. But here's what he said after waking up. And these are the very first words that he uttered to the nurse who was standing beside his bed. Am I still in heaven? Am I still in hell? There's some people out there. They need people of God. Yes. He went on to say, I don't think Satan's quite as cool 
old as I used to. Do you know what Mr. Will Carroll, drummer for a thrash band, needs? He needs a man and a woman of God to break open the word. He needs a true Christian to pray for him. He doesn't need someone that's living a double life. He needs somebody that's filled with the joy of his people and full of God's glory. He doesn't need a self-help guru. God is the way in the hell. Narrow is the path. And few there be the fight. Stand with me if you would. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Ye are all children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. We have no business dabbling in some of the things that we dabble in. We have no business playing in some of the arenas that we're playing in. We have no business reading some of the things that we are reading or doing some of the things that we are doing. Our extracurricular activities are diluting the anointing of Jesus Christ. In our lives, it's flickering. It's not burning brightly. So as we begin to sing, I want to read this to you one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Since God has so generously let us in on what He is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into an occasional hard time. We refuse to wear masks. We refuse to play games. We don't maneuver. We don't manipulate. We don't twist God's words to suit what we want them to be. But rather we open the word of God and we love and we show compassion. I'm asking you today, I pray that you were convicted to remove your spiritual mats and to be about Jesus Christ. Be the Christian. Be Christ-like. Be what he's called us to be.
we have a ministry to do. You have a whole harvest field all around you. You have souls. We have received the mercy. Now let's thank God. I challenge you today to go win souls. I challenge you to not faint, to not grow weary in the work of the Lord, but to work your ministry. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us uh, for the services online. Uh, it's going to be good to be back in God's house next week with each and every one of you. Amen. It's just going to be a, a celebration that I can say that we have never had before. And when we come back in, we're going to we're going to have a few different things that we can't do, shaking hands and some things, but if we could all come in with the mindset to give the king his glory. Yes. I tell you, God is going to be in this place. Amen. I'm going to thank you in advance for your patience with the ALT staff. Uh, from parking to waiting on the carport uh, to coming inside and being seated by an usher. I want to thank you in advance for your cooperation. Uh, we want to uh, encourage you, if you desire to wear a mask, please feel free to wear a mask. Uh, it is not going to be mandatory. Uh, but if also at this time you don't feel that um, you're ready to leave the stay at home and the quarantine, I want you to know that you are still a part of this family and the doors are going to be open for you when you decide uh, that you are ready to venture out of your home. Amen. We love you and we appreciate you. We will uh, be sending out some information this week and uh, communicating with you about next week's service. But again, the doors will not be open until 10, 15, staff will be coming and going. But please honor that. The doors will not be open until 10, 15. So feel free to sit in your cars uh, and uh, fast this week sometime. It's Pentecost Sunday. Fast, pick at least one day this week, fast, and pray for Sunday specifically. Amen. God bless. We love you. And we will see you at 10, 15 at Abundant Life Tabernacle, May 31st. Amen.